proven and progressive. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the political leader of the United National Congress, Kamla Prasad Bisesa. Thank you all. Thank you very much. UNC family and the family of all of us in Trinidad and Tobago, I say a warm good evening to all of you as we meet and greet again on yet another Monday evening to the MP for this constituency, Dr. Boti Bari, all those at the head table, other MPs, senators, councillors, all the men, and of course all members of the UNC gathered here and those tuned in. I say good evening to you. It's a great evening, isn't it? And thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming out again. But whilst we are here, jubilant and happy, I just want us to think of our brothers and sisters, our cousins in the Bahamas. They have been battered and bruised with Hurricane Dorian. And so we send them our prayers, our greetings. I want to thank the Trinidad Tobago Manufacturers Association. When I'm coming, I heard on the news that they are prepared and willing to help to send supplies to our brothers and sisters in the Bahamas. Give them a round of applause. And whilst I know there are many here who are poor and who are suffering, can you imagine just the litter that you had? Just blown away your roof, everything inside your house gone. So let us not begrudge any help that we can send. And I'm asking you here, UNC family and all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, let us go on a drive, let us raise some food stuff, raise food stuff so we can send off to the Bahamas. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to help? And in the meantime, I hope the government of Trinidad and Tobago will get its act together to help them there in the Bahamas. It could be us. It could have been us. But God is always great and hurricane passes by. And I heard on the news as well when I'm coming that the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, he's waiting until the storm passes before he can decide what help T and T will give. Well, that's up to him. But I think we know what help they need. They need food and they need water, first of all. Basic supplies. So let's start to gather it. Use the constituency offices, councillors' offices, and the Manufacturers Association has said, anybody willing to donate, they are willing to assist to get it to the Bahamas. So are you in that food drive, water drive, clothing? Think of the children there. And let us put our hands together to help them. So today, whilst we pray with our brothers and sisters in the Bahamas, we pray for the children of Trinidad and Tobago. Today is the first day back to school. And your UNC people throughout the country they have been working very very hard thousands of book bags and um, school supplies have been collected and distributed take a look at this video please which is a short video of what has been happening over the last few days as you walk with us to the part of life you will never have to walk alone come on
I say thank you to Team UNC. And we always say to our children, they will never walk alone. We will hold their hands and we will lift them up. So, Team UNC, our counselors, our MPs, our coordinators, throughout the length and breadth, in drop and beat them, giving out uh, book bags, throughout the length and breadth, north, south, east, west. Thank you. Give a big round of applause. And thank the sponsors who helped us to do this. So these are the, the, the um, news issues of the week, basically. I know we have some pains. Uh, a school opened today. Some schools still remain unopened. I trust that the Minister of Education will do his job, wake up and do his job, and get our children back into schools. And in the meantime, if the children are still home, parents, you have a duty. Friends, please help them. Don't let them fall behind whilst they wait for schools to open. Give them that hand up. So here we are, just celebrated 57 years of independence. And I want us to remember, we all came on different ships. But today we are in the same boat that is in Trinidad and Tobago. We may have come on different ships from all the great nations of the world. Today we are one nation, united, T and T, where every creed and race should find an equal place. We are in the same boat. And we have had really our share of challenges over the years since independence, you know. But I still believe that TNT is one of the best places in the world. Do you believe that? This is our home. We have our problems. We can see people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different races, religions, but at the end of the day, we live together in harmony. I want to quote the words of a very well-known song. Sweet TNT is my country. Every creed and race have an equal place. We shall overcome one day. One day I say, all this misery and pain, pain and strain, we have to unite to stand up and fight, and we'll get things right one day, sweet TNT. Thanks to that great singer, I'm proud to be a Trini, and I'm sure you're proud too. We have been forged with courage, determination, and a great will to chart our own destiny. However, we have two great challenges in many ways. Okay, we have three. First challenge is, so the first uh, problem we have to solve is to get rid of Rowley and his government. I agree with you. Dr. Bo was telling us of all the problems and solutions, and I heard you in the crowd shouting, Get rid of Raleigh and his government. Politically, democratically, through elections, attack us. Say, what time is it? It's election time, and we have to vote them out. Vote them out. Today, one of the greatest freedoms that we have is the freedom of speech. Throughout our history as a democracy, and even before our time, stemming from the great parliament, the mother of all parliaments, stemming way back since 1066, in the common law of the land, before it was even written in our constitutions, we had the right to freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Today I see two obstacles to this. The first, of course, is in the news for the last few days and before. And it has to do with the sedition laws. Sedition laws. Now, I see Dr. Rowley saying, well, there's an old law, an archaic law, and how old it is, and get rid of all, all the old laws. It's not about the fact there's an old law, you know. It is what is the intent of that law. And when it was passed, what was the intention? And that intention was to stifle brown, brown people and black people in our country. Here, yeah, in 1920, because in 1919, this was the year when we were fighting the colonial masters and the only way they could have stopped us was to bring in the sedition law. So anything you say, they just hold you, lock you up, and throw you in jail. Today that law has no place in a free and democratic country. And therefore it should be repealed, removed, and completely taken off of statute books. You know, we aspired more than a half a century ago to throw off all chains of colonial servitude, right? 
and to build a democratic society to benefit everyone. We have made strides, but as we celebrate this 57 years, I said it was ironic at the same time we celebrated in 57 years of independence, on the eve of that, the government was locking up people under the oppressive law by the colonial masters, the sedition law. So can we say we have thrown up? Can we say Massa they really done? We cannot because they're using the Massa law to lock up people for just expressing themselves. Look, listen to what Watson Duke said. Okay, this is what he said. You look at the screen and I'll read it for you. This is your belief, folks. This is your family. And I'm sending the message clear. Let Rowley them know that the day they come for us in Wassa, we are prepared to die and the morgue would be picking up people. How is that attacking? How is that going to bring down the government or the state? The man is saying we are prepared to die. But listen to what Heinz said. But Heinz never got charged. Look at the screen again. Listen. I will read and look at the screen. This is Fitzgerald Hines. I said to my colleagues, as a younger parliamentarian then, I said the UNC is badly wounded. We need to finish them out. Kill them dead. I want you to understand that on November 28, you have the opportunity to drive a PNM and deep into the hearts of the wicked UNC vampires. Take a stick with a balish on top and drive it deep within their heart and finish them off once and for all. This is a man actually telling you to go and kill people. But nobody said he was guilty of sedition. And a man, Watson Duke, who says we are willing to die. You lock him up because why? He's a political opponent. I think they know they're going to lose the two Tobago seats to Watson Duke. And they want to get rid of him. Go brave, brother. You go with your own party, go brave, and we wish you the best of luck. So what is worse? A man who, he who tells his union members that we are prepared to die for our rights, or another one, Heinz, who is telling people, kill them kill them but nothing is wrong i ask you which is worse there is no investigation on him no charge no protest from the government for heinz while the other is being prosecuted and persecuted and so i'm saying i do my duty as opposition leader and we in the opposition have a duty to hold the government accountable to ask questions to protect all patriotic citizens from running a foul abreast against the law and an ever increasing oppressive government. There is no question that this government shows all the signs of dictatorship. They try to pass laws to allow them to seize your property if they accuse you of crime. They just have to accuse you of the crime. They have no evidence. Somebody just point and say, you commit the crime and they will take your property. But we stop them in the parliament, okay? They want to pass another piece of law called a cybercrime bill. And so I warn you all citizens, including the media, you have to be warned because they want to criminalize your freedom of speech, whether it be on social media or whether mainstream media, that is what they're seeking to do. And again, coming up again, misusing the Sedition Act, to target all those they think are speaking against them. Well, Dr. Rowley, I'll tell you something. Soon the whole country will be condemning your government. And I want to see you try to lock up all the good right-thinking citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. They cannot do that. And so I urge you, do not be intimidated. Do not be afraid. We have to speak out against this government for their wicked and corrupt ways. This is the most wicked and corrupt government we have ever seen in our country. <laughs> Dr. Rowley spoke yesterday, at the, uh, Saturday, at the police um, function, Independence Day function. And he said, when they're asking about the Sedition Act, about repealing it, getting rid of it, he said, um, 
But what about other old laws? Maybe we should get rid of other old laws. The murder law. You mentioned that one. Can you imagine? What nonsense and foolishness from the leader of our country. He questioned that people should be free to make statements under the guise of free speech. He said, and I quote, I want to ask this. Is it the act, meaning the Sedition Act, is it the act itself that is a problem? Or is it a right for citizen, head of one sector of the country, to make disparaging, hurtful, and damaging statements on another sector and say it is my right and free will to say so? I want to ask this. Is it the act, Sedition Act itself, is a problem? Or is the right of a citizen to make disparaging, hurtful, and damaging statements? Well, that one to me takes the cake. I wonder how we could say this with a straight face. Because you see, the whole country knows the kinds of terms, this, the words this man has used to describe me. Members of the UNC, members of the nation, members of the population. Every time he speaks, he makes the whole, most damaging and hurtful comments. Is he seditious? No, he's expressing his view. We don't agree with him. But that's his freedom of expression. So when he tells the woman of the country, choose your men wisely, is he not damaging the women who have been abused and battered? When he talks all these things, he talks, you see it up, I think even has a video, but we we'll show you that another day. In other countries, listen, remember the first man they charged was Sat Maraj. Didn't charge him, they had a search warrant, they haven't charged him yet, but they brought the search warrant saying sedition. A religious leader, we know he's a critic against the government, so they go against a religious leader. Now they've come against a trade union leader, Duke, and in fact they've charged him, but he's not just a trade union leader, he is a leader of a political party. So be warned, they will use this law against all their opponents, whether it's religious, civil society, politicians, they will come against us. And I stand to say we must not be afraid to speak out against this government. A lot of countries have now abolished this sedition law. It's old. Yes, it's old. But what was the intent? The intent was to shut up people, to pre prevent people from protesting against bad conditions. It's the intention of the law. That law has no place in our independent democratic country. So we have even the United Kingdom, in Britain, in England, mother of all parliaments, they have abolished the sedition law. In Ghana, Indonesia, Malawi, India, Malaysia, Nigeria, Botswana, Liberia, these laws are said to be used to stifle dissent by journalists and by NGOs. The law criminalizing sedition was where? In Britain. That's where it started. They have totally repealed. New Zealand has abolished the law. So in every forward-going developing nation and developed nation, they have removed the sedition law. You know why? Because there are other laws that can be used. If someone defames you, you can go in the law of defamation. There are other laws that you do not need sedition because with sedition, even strangely enough, you have no defense. In defamation, meaning you're about to talk somebody and sue you for defaming their character, and they take you to court for what you said, you have a defense, you will say, it is true, it is justifiable, that is the truth. For sedition, even if it's true or not true, you're still getting locked up. Yes? So it's a very dangerous piece of law, a kind of strict liability offense where how do you defend yourself? You have to go and say, well, I wasn't trying to overthrow Rowley, but I really want to overthrow him politically. I want us to vote him out. That's what we really want to happen. That's what we can say. So whether it is true or not, when Duke said, look, we are prepared to die for our rights. We are prepared to die. You come at us, tell Rowley and them, we are prepared to die. What's wrong with that? If a man says he's prepared to die, we better give him, um, what do you call it? Um, drips. Life-saving life water, they call it. Give them some saline um, in a drip and put him, let him be and stay alive. So friends, everywhere... The Prime Minister's turned post-cabinet briefings into attacks on people. His new society is really that of a dictatorship, a tyrant, where they are the kings and the lords and ladies. And maybe that's why 
He moved with such haste to refurbish Whitehall. I guess he wanted to fulfill the prophecy of his book from Mason Hall to Whitehall. Well, Dr. Rowley, thank you for fixing up Whitehall because we will be the next government and we will use Whitehall. We will make great use of it. I want to deal with a more serious issue. I told you there are two threats to freedom of speech, but really, you reminded me there's a first threat, which is Rowley and his government. The second is sedition law. And, and this may be a little long and um, serious for you, but I really want to say tonight, I want to talk about outrage cult culture. Outrage culture. That's another threat to freedom of speech. What is outrage culture? This is the second great threat to freedom of speech. Outrage culture is defined as when people play the victim card, they bend over backwards to be offended uh, as much as they could when they really are not offended. So they pretend to be the victim, they bend over, and they say, oh God, this thing's so bad, Kamala said this, Denny said this, who say what, Duke say that, Satmaraj say that, and they're so offended, they're not offended, really, they are not. That is called outrage culture. They get outraged, okay? People on social media platforms, mainstream media, also constantly rage against one another, they enjoy taking offense to everything to the detriment of our society. This causes outrage culture to devalue the importance of sharing ideas and tolerating different opinions. This now has become a serious self-inflicted impediment to free speech. When persons voice concerns and opinions about awkward and complex topics such as race, sexism, gender, politics, and so on. When persons raise these issues, what happens? Instead of a serious discussion on serious matters, they attack the messenger. They vilify the messenger for raising a topic. There seems to be a concerted effort to play the victim card each time to prevent serious discussion about serious issues. And so as a society, we keep kicking the can down the road instead of frontally discussing our problems. And yes, problems we do have. Outrage culture, we see it depicted by outbursts in which people claim their moral superiority. They crave public recognition. We see this in people's politically and morally charged posts where the comments sections overflow with fights. The fact is criticisms and opposing views are not to be considered insults, but we should look at them objectively and discuss them. These are the issues of the day. Outrage culture has become a part of society with many people enjoying hearing and judging others' information, and outrage fuels the transfer of gossip. However, using outrage as a framework for morals and identity, what it creates is us versus them. It creates a framework of us versus them an environment like that. So people are one of two ends of the spectrum, yes? They don't see the gray areas in between. It's either totally left or totally right. And the different opinions are not tolerated by any one side. The media has taken advantage of people's constant need for fighting. Regardless of political ideologies, race, gender, economic background, there are articles, there are blogs, posts, and news reports that are meant to incite viewers and readers. To cap the attention, many will use, use that fuel of anger and emotion and fear rather than address the actual issues at hand. And so the original intent for outrage culture is to call out the oppressors and bring serious issues to light, but it instead is being used for what I see to commit covert racism. It is being used to silence dissenting opinions. This should never happen, no matter how disagreeable different perspectives may seem. Whenever uncomfortable topics in TNT are raised, outrage culture steps in to scuttle a serious discussion. This is why the problems do not get addressed. It is because people get intimidated and afraid. They want to speak out because they fear being ridiculed for expressing an opinion. And this is the reason why covert discrimination is so prevalent in our country today. 
And what is it born from? Covert discrimination is born out of the social elite, the haves that Dr. Tiwari spoke about. Intent to maximize profit at the expense of the others, the have-nots. And so those who have want to keep the status quo as it is. They want to keep us batten in our own creases and do not unite, do not come together. Stay as you are. Keep the status quo. So those who have will remain where they are. And those who have not will forever remain as have-nots. But that is not the way. Overt discrimination has taken up all kinds of forms behind a kind of face, a facade of politeness, politi political correctness and expediency. No, you mustn't talk about that. Don't talk about that. Don't talk about racism in the country. Do not talk about LBGTQ. Do not talk about things by some. But if these are issues confronting us, we must have serious discussion rather than the yes and the no and in the middle coughing on each other. They have, they have nots. Do not talk about poverty in this country, they will tell you. One man, the leader of the country, said, don't preach doom and gloom. Well, if there's doom and gloom, we have to talk about it. These are the issues. These are the issues. I agree we don't lay blame, but we just understand the framework and the scenario so we can mash it up, break it up, so that everyone in this country will have an equal space and an equal place. And so the heart of this covert discrimination of cultural outrage, one finds a deliberate policy of denial, omission of all issues and persons and groups. So you see persons in the haves, and the haves are not one race, you know. The haves belong to every race, every color, every creed, in every part of the country. These haves use their influence in the mainstream to say, don't speak about discrimination, don't speak about racism, don't speak about sexism, don't speak about gender issues, and instead, they attack people who are trying to raise these issues for mature discussion. So my friends, it is very easy to kill the messenger. Very easy to kill the messenger and never address the message. In that way, you silence discussion on very important topics. And this happens when we hear the truth and they think the truth is too much to hear at this time. When the truth hangs so painfully heavy on their shoulders, they rather get rid of the weight than actually face the issues head on. Well, why would the truth be a burden for someone? And I tell you, there are many serious issues in our country, and we must, we must. Let me give you an example of covert discrimination. 300 days out of 365 days of the year, you have negative stories about people from Lavanti. Yes? 300 days. John John? Out of 365 days, negative stories about Lavanti. Very few positive stories. This is disproportionate reporting. It creates negative perceptions. So everybody is conditioned to believe everyone in that era is a bad person. And that could never be true. In every area, you have the good and the bad and the ugly. Agreed? In every part of the land. So when people from Lavantil go to get jobs now, or beat them go to get jobs, nobody wants to hire them. Because in their mind, there has been, there has been created this image of people from Beatham and Lavanti. And so the cycle of unemployment continues. Now the same media should highlight positive stories in greater proportion to the negative ones. You need balancing. You cannot write all that is negative about the community and then expect the people to rise up as good citizens. I give you that as an example of covert racism. When you brandish, when you brand, tarnish, stigmatize the people of one part of the country as the worst people in the land. As the UNC leader, if I start to speak about this covert discriminatory bias and address it truthfully, there will be those who will want to come to kill me as the messenger, but I'm not afraid of them. We have to confront these issues. So through the weapons of outrage culture and silencing, they will attempt to smear me and the UNC. Be warned. Many times the people jump up and say X, Y, P, Q. They will not divide us, but they are actually the ones who are perpetrating the most division in the country. 
to the detriment of the poor and the marginalized. And so I urge you, ready yourself, stay strong, stay united and focused. We must ensure that future genera generations will have the freedom to express themselves. I want you to remember this, and I urge you to stay strong. They have started a new narrative. They say the opposition is the most dangerous set of people and the most evil people. Yes, I saw Heinz post something about dangerous and evil and so on. But the most dangerous people in this country is the Keith Rowley government. Most dangerous. And the most wicked and incompetent. Do not believe a word they have to say. Look at the screen, please. And you'll get some examples of their lies. They were never legitimate emails. It was something that was typed out by someone. But what was done by the police was based on the request by the then Prime Minister. You should know that Trinidad and Tobago's future lies with honesty in public office and that public officers must be made to be honest and accountable in Trinidad and Tobago. He decided to use the cover of parliamentary privilege to lead their these allegations that have now turned out to be fake. To make one clear statement to you, first and foremost, the government is not closing down Petrochrin. Employees of, of Petrochrin will, will exit the company, all, all, all. Do we get that clear so that nobody has to call me about 10 o'clock in the night to find me? How many of us going again? It is politically justified, I believe, and for people to call for his resignation. And, and this needs to be cleared up. And maybe what we need to do is to have a general election for the people to decide the way forward. The way forward. He's a liar, liar. Do not believe a word they say to you. Let's talk a little bit about today's economic and global reality because that's very important. I think apart from crime, the need for jobs is one of the greatest needs in TNT at this time. So as the world moves rapidly to the integrated digital economy, which is based on renewable energies, artificial intelligence, and automation, 
Our gas and oil-based economy is here, but we will face challenges in growing and maintaining jobs, revenues, and expenditure. By 2040, which is, it sounds far away, but it's not too far away, most developed countries, they would have phased out combustion engines and they will have electric vehicles. They would have changed power generation to renewable energy instead of the fossil fuels that we now use and the plastics for consumer use will be replaced by environmentally friendly materials. So it's a different world that we're moving into. This will be combined with other and more plentiful supplies of oil and gas. New producers right next to us in Guyana and the USA will severely decrease the demand for our oil, our energy products, oil and gas. Artificial intelligence and automation will result in less conventional manufacturing jobs for people, as all businesses will seek out the most efficient means of production and operation. The jobs of today will not exist in the future and in the very near future. As a nation, we must plan and we must prepare and implement to adapt to meet this new rea reality, and we must do so immediately. That is why we started giving the laptops to the children to prepare them for the digital age. These fellas so dunsy head, they took away the laptops of the children. Took away the laptops. That was beginning from that age. Our next step was to go to the primary school level to give them the tablets. So from the time they hit school, they would be trained in the digital age with the computer technology. You see, but they don't care because they and their children, they could afford to buy laptop and tablet for their children, but the thousands of parents in this country cannot afford to do it. They cannot afford it. But they don't care about them. It's again the haves and the have-nots. And that is why I showed you the book bags there. The father of the nation, the real father of the nation, Eric Williams, he had said that the future of the children is in the book bags. So we're going back and giving the book bags. But the answer was, the answer to that was, that was then. Now the future of the nation is in the laptops, in the book bags of the children, the laptops. And when we see these big book bags on children back breaking, first of all, you can't buy the books. And if you can get it, you can't afford it or someone helps you, then you have this big heavy backpack on your back, breaking your back. We had started with a plan to use e-books. E-books, you put it on a flash drive. Flash drive weighs what a few, not even one ounce or two. And they are very, very cheap. I'm told the flash drives are so cheap. So all the books could have been on a flash drive. So what your child will carry to school? The laptop and the flash drive. And therefore, I want to give you the undertaking, should you give us back that chance and put us back into government, we'll continue the laptop program <clears throat> and add to the e-books, the e-books on the flash drives. So I'm saying we have some new plans to plan for the new future. I've shared some already, but I want to roll out some more. And um, I know in April 2018, when I did the last um, reply to the budget, I rolled out, rolled out some of those plans on the platform. I've been talking about them for improvements in education, crime fighting, job creation, state enterprises, um, sector, and of course, tax alleviation. There's a famous saying, you cannot tax a nation into prosperity. They have increased the taxes not once, not twice. They've increased the fuel prices, I think, about three times. And the short months laughing at everybody in the country saying, they ain't riot yet. They ain't riot yet. That is his marker, but he doesn't know the suffering on the people of our country. So I saw a share plans. One plan I told you, we will do as we can our best to bring back the laptops for the children and to give them the e-books on the flash drive. That is in education. Let's look at some plans to increase productive capacity, to increase foreign direct investment, to increase the ease of doing business. And all of this is to do what? To facilitate job 
creation so that people can have jobs in this country. One um, gentleman told me uh, um, two nights ago, three nights ago, one we know very well, he said, he said, boss lady, my three children, everyone has a degree and not one has a job. All of them and me and the wife, we living off my pension. Yes. Well, he lucky even have a pension. But that's the state of affairs. The young people, all the children, highly qualified. I won't tell me that just now to Chairman Awang. Most people you talk with, they have highly qualified children. But no job. They want them to go and sell medicine in the drugstore over the road. That beautiful state-of-the-art hospital to benefit the women and children and the men. It wasn't just a children's hospital, it was for everybody. All the equipment inside there. I've put out a video on my face, we could watch it. That is how we left it, fully equipped. They want to sell medicine and make it into a glorified drugstore. Well, I bet you, within a few days, even if so long, they won't even have, med even have the medicine, the seed up to sell there. Because a lot of the pharmacies don't even have the seed up medicines. You're taking this big, beautiful hospital and say you're going to sell medicines. But I always knew, we always knew the housing was a drugstore owner, eh? so don't be surprised. He'll take the, he's a pharmacist or something. Don't be surprised. So I'm saying, what are some of the plans that I can roll out tonight? We can put flesh on it, but this is just a, just a skeleton because of the time. First, we have to lower corporation taxes. We have to drop it down. Over the five years, we have to drop it corporation tax. Because every time a business has to pay this high tax, what happens? You have to fire workers because you're not making money because people are not buying. We have to lower taxes. You know what Trump did in the USA? They lowered the ta business taxes, corporation taxes. And businesses from around the world who had gone into tax havens where they had to pay less tax, they are repatriating back to the USA. And I'll give you the example of Apple. Apple is repatriating back its business in the USA because why? They have to pay lower corporation taxes. And that's another way to attract foreign direct investment. If we drop the corporation tax, more businesses will be willing to come to invest here and therefore create jobs and create revenue. So the businesses know how best to utilize their money. And so we should not overtax them. Instead, to return the taxation in misdirected subsidies. We take the tax and we're giving it in misdirected subsidies. Let the businesses run their business and let them create jobs. Let there be productive capacity in our country. You overtax them and they start to shut down. Um, Dr. Tiwari probably has the start so many businesses have shut down in our country. And you will know from your own neighborhoods how many businesses have shut down, jobs lost. The second thing I think we should do is to make sure there is no property tax on plant and equipment, land and building of local manufacturers, local businesses. No tax on that. So that, they, again, if the business have less tax to pay what? They could create more jobs. Thirdly, we should deregulate and simplify the process for getting clearances and license. For example, envir en environmental clearances approvals for new and existing businesses because where there is over regulation and very prohibitive initial requirements these increase your startup costs for a business they cause delays it chase away chases away new businesses and often it will stifle fledging business so you try to set up a business ease of doing a business in this country our rankings have fallen since Rowley's PNM came into government we had ranked very well on the ease of doing business. All of that has gone through, gone through in the flood. And so often, after meeting the initial requirements, there is no continuous assessment, and the result is environmental degradation of the course of the business operations. So to address these issues, we should encourage businesses. Once they are up and running, you know what they must do? They must implement an environmental management system such as the ISO 14,000 series. This measure will lessen initial requirements, speed up time of getting the business operational, and will also provide continuous monitoring of operations 
over the course of the life of the business. Further, we should pursue double taxation agreements with more countries in South America, West Africa, and other Commonwealth countries. Do you know the market in, in South America is 422 million people? We should pursue double taxation agreements with them. We should strengthen legislation to protect minority shareholders. We should aggressively enhance legislation regarding contract law and mediation. At present, it takes four to six to eight to ten years to settle disputes, contract disputes. So if we put a stronger legislative framework to settle disputes, then this will make contracts more secure. If we prevent unwarranted litigation, we we'll shorten resolution time and prevent uh, litigation, which encourages, thereby encouraging investor confidence. Now, I know we have an issue with the Venice, but again, we should make Spanish a compulsory language in our schools. And you know why? The 422 million market in South America. We have to reach out there. We cannot continue to trade only with our older partners. Yes, we will, the USA and Britain and so on. But you have 422 million people in South America so that our businesses can export. Right now, I wonder if you know pepper is one of the biggest trading items. Pepper. Pepper. Every pepper you grow, you can get it exported. Every pepper you grow. Ask the pepper growers. Pineapples too. Pineapple is another area where every pineapple you grow, you could get it sold or exported. Ask Brian Mohan. He has a, all of them, Brian Mohan, he has a pineapple farm. So, I'm saying Spanish as a compulsory second language to help us to open up that 420 million market in South America. We should also implement, of course, computer technology, software development as core parts of the education syllabus as we prepare to survive what I told you, the digital economy. We must increase the ease of doing business. One way we can do that is by implementing a quality assurance management system, which is one that is known as the ISO 9001 2015 in specific units related to business development, statutory approvals, credit facilities, tax currencies, financial accreditation in the following areas. Legal affairs, utilities, WASA, TNTEC, NGC, customs and exercise, excise, BIR, EMA, EMA, town and country, FIU, and the building inspectorate. We must align all these units under a common quality management system to increase the ease of doing business. I know tonight, I may be a bit over your head, but these are some of the things we have to do. It's all well and good. I will stand here and tell you, we created 50,000 jobs on our office. We will create another 50,000 jobs and more when you put us back. But I have to share with those who ask me how, and these are some of the ways that we can do that. So bear with me. We can decrease our costs of exporting a container of locally manufactured goods by approximately 200, approximately 200 to 300 US dollars. We can do this by what we started to do, improving road infrastructure to decrease the cost of transport from factory to ports, from the farmer's field to the ports. We can do this by hiring more customs and excise personnel. And of course, we can increase efficiency at the operations at the port. We can invest heavily in improving port infrastructure to attract new shipping lines. We can increase the number of bonded areas off-site the ports, thus freeing up space within the ports for exporters. We can strengthen management and technology systems to reduce inspection and documentation times and speed up through flow times. All of this will help in the ease of doing business, bring in more investment and create more jobs. We must also invest and expand the TTB Bureau of Standards to enhance the ability to test products and reject inferior products. There are some who uh, flood us with dumping of inferior products, and this has been to the detriment of local manufacturers, so they bring in the inferior product, they sell it for a lower price, and what happens to the local man producing the same things? Business is lost. We will work with the CARICOM members to create a new and enhanced existing trade arrangement with South America. 
And we will look at what I told you before, building industry in, industries in food processing and packaging, manufacture of basic medical supplies and disposables, manufacture of medical furniture, manufacture of office and school furniture, manufacture of specialist chemicals for the oil and gas industry and for the medical industry, garment manufacturing, a metals foundry, glassworks, electronic assembly, and e-waste recycling. These are just a few of the ideas. And of course, we will put them into place and implement to create more jobs. I want you to remember, when we were in office, as I told you, we created over 50,000 jobs, 2010 to 2015. You know what's important? We created those without raising any new tax. Not one new tax. We brought unemployment down to the lowest in the history of our country, to 3.3%. We saved the most money in our history in 2014. Cash and bank in HSF, US 31.1 billion, which is 89 billion TNT dollars we left in the HSF fund. They have been raiding, they say no money, no money. They've been raiding the treasury, my friends. We spent 2010 to 15, and we did spend to bring positive growth and jobs. Our incentives in the oil and gas sector resulted in increased production for our country. My friends, we are approaching the fourth year. This weekend, four years of the Rowley PNM, September 7, and the start of the last year of the Rowley PNM. That's why, that's why. So I'm asking you, are you better off today than you were five years ago? Do you feel safer today? We have seen 2,000 people murdered since the Rowley government came into power. I want to remind you, we brought serious crimes down when we were in office to the lowest in decades. And we brought the murder rate in 2012, I believe, was the lowest, 2011 the lowest murder rate since 2004. Over the last four years, we have gone from our road of prosperity and equality to going down a path of unemployment, violent crime, and chaos. I ask you, do you have more job opportunities today than you had five years ago? Do you have better health care today? Do you and your children have better educational opportunities today? Is the government taking care of your needs in your communities? And so we see the worrying signs all around us in every sector, in every sector. And the feedback on the eve of independence, 200 more given letters retrenched. You know what retrenched means? Fired from the University of Trinidad and Tobago. They said they did it to save $2 million per month. And now we have $20 million to build a palace for Rowley. Take a look at it. $20 million to build this palace for Rowley. But you fire to save $2 million. I send home 200 UTT workers and more. Twenty million and counting. That's the palace in Tobago. So we have a decision to make and we have a choice to make. What do we do? What is needed now? In every constituency we need to take back our communities, take back our villages and our towns, and take back our country. Everywhere people are lost and in despair. We are at a very important moment, so I ask you, let us unite. Let us unite, let us stand together as one, and let us rescue Trinidad and Tobago and get TNT working again. I am UNC and I am proud. I am UNC and I'm proud, and show me your voting figure. Show me your voting figure. With this finger, we bring down the power, and we will vote them out. God bless you. God bless Trinidad and Tobago.